Uh, so uh, yesterday we looked at um, justice in God and we're moving to think about justice in his people. And the key principle going on here, um, and I'll make this point to start with, in a sense we've already seen it this morning, but I'm gonna then make it as we go through, is that God's people are to reflect God himself. And they're to reflect him in his justice. Uh, this is what I am like in myself. This is what you are to be like. It's like the be holy because I am holy principle. Be just because I am just. And um, uh, Jason finished this morning, didn't he, in Isaiah 53 with how, if, if that is how God justifies us, if that's how he acts, that has implications for how we care for each other. He took us to James 2, for example. Uh, a key way we're gonna have a look at that principle is we're gonna have a look at God's laws for his people. Uh, laws to do with justice. Uh, and there are a number of these in the Old Testament and then we'll move to the, for the New Testament. We'll spend a fair bit of time in Old Testament laws. Um, in looking at that, we are seeing two things. That God's laws, first of all, show us um, the, the shape of life that he wants among his people, how they are to treat each other, how they are to relate. And so it will inform something of the shape of life amongst us as his people today. But the other way of understanding uh, the law is to re realize that they are examples of love. I mean, Jesus says that all of the commandments all of the law is summed up in the, Lord, the command to love God and to love neighbor. The Apostle Paul says the same in Romans 13, whatever command there is, do not commit adultery, etc. it's all summed up in the command to love. So you can take this a couple of ways. You can kind of go, well, well, the Old Testament law then is telling us effectively just to love each other, so we should love each other. But then you ask, well, what does love look like? How should we love each other? Well, the law will give me examples of that. Whatever I'm told to do and not do, that will be a loving thing. Now, we're gonna to have to do some translation from Old Testament Israel to us today, but that's the principle. In other words, love is not a kind of flexible, mushy mass of goodwill. Love has a kind of direction to it, a moral compass to it. It reflects God's character and values. So putting those two things together, in looking at examples of love, we're seeing the shape a loving community should take, how a loving community will act towards each other. So let's have a look at some Old Testament laws and let's begin here. Do not follow the crowd in doing wrong. When you give testimony in a lawsuit, do not pervert justice by siding with the crowd. Uh, this, this verse and a number that will follow talk about perverting justice or denying justice. Uh, it has the idea of kind, of kind of twisting it, bending it out of shape in some way. And the key thing going on here, you see the way it will get bent out of shape here? It's by the influence of others. Do not follow the crowd. Don't pervert justice by siding with the crowd. Don't, don't let majority opinion mean you don't follow the path of justice. Uh, this is in the example of a lawsuit, but it raises a broader question for us. Who influences us? Who influences our decisions in church life? All the variety of decisions we make about how we treat people in church and what we do in different situations, could the majority opinion twist things somehow? Uh, second example. Do not deny justice to your poor people in their lawsuits. Again, denying justice is the same word actually, perverting, twisting justice. Uh, this is in a lawsuit again, but it's more literally just a contention or a dispute. It could be a legal one, but it could be any kind of contention where you had to decide. I hope you know in the Old Testament you had 
you, know, you had judges and so on, you had elders in towns, elders who met at the city gate to discuss business and kind of manage the life of the people and there would be contentions, people would bring issues to them. What do we do about this or that in the life of God's people? Do not deny justice is one of the great commands. And here, the people who are potentially at risk are the poor. You you probably know the the vulnerable people in in, in the Old Testament, there are are, are four groups. Uh, The poor, the widow, uh, the orphan, and the foreigner are the four groups. And sometimes they come individually, like here, just the poor. Sometimes they're grouped together, twos or threes or fours. They are those who have less power, less social capital, less influence. Uh, It's not obvious who would speak up for them because they don't have, say, the father of the family, for example, who'd defend them. So they were more vulnerable and more likely to be exploited. And so... Be careful not to deny them justice. And then lastly here, just notice how they're described. Who are they? Your poor. They belong to you. They're part of your community. You're not to abandon them. Uh, That raises the question, not only of the judgments we make generally, but who are the vulnerable in our churches? Who has less social capital, less influence, less voice? Who could we overlook in some way? And we're going to come back to that. Uh, Next one. Do not pervert justice. Again, twist justice. Do not show partiality to the poor or favoritism to the great, but judge your neighbor fairly. So again, similar broad command, don't pervert justice. But now, how might it have to happen? Showing partiality, discriminating in some way, having a preference for one person over another so that you don't do what's right and give what's due and appropriate. And here the example's given both ways. You could be preferential to the poor or to the great, the the rich, the the powerful, the influential. Uh, Most commonly in the Old Testament, the the, the warning is asymmetrical. It's the poor, the widow, the vulnerable. But, But God doesn't want preferential treatment of any kind. And so it finishes with judge your neighbor fairly, literally in righteousness. Notice again, it's your neighbor. Uh, Similarly, we hear Moses talk about how he entrusted judgment to judges. I charge your judges at that time. Hear the disputes between your people and judge fairly, righteously. Whether the case is between two Israelites or between an Israelite and a foreigner residing among you, do not show partiality in judging. Here, both small and great alike, do not be afraid of anyone, for judgment belongs to God. Judge fairly, righteously. Do it whether it's two Israelites or an Israelite and a foreigner. No preference for the person who is kind of relationally closer to you. The person who's been in the church a longer time. The person you know better or or, or whatever it is. It's framed positively. Judge fairly. And then negatively, no partiality in your judging. No regard to the person, small or great, insignificant or significant. You know, we sometimes say justice is to be blind, don't we? You may know the, the, you know, on the, is it the law courts in London, there's the, 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 there's the scales of justice and there's a blindfold. In other words, you're not to notice anything about the person that would influence your judgment of them. In that sense, it's to be blind. We'll come to a way it's not to be blind in a minute. But in that sense, it's to be blind. You're not to be affected by who the person is. And here, it's not being afraid of anyone. You could judge badly because you're worried about the outcomes. What that person might do, what people might think of you, how they might react. 
and fear of some sort could shape your decision making in church life. No, do not be afraid of anyone, why not? For judgment belongs to God. He judges righteously, he shows no partiality and you are to reflect him. Later on in Deuteronomy, God commands his people in a, in a similar way. Appoint judges and officials for each of your tribes in every town the Lord your God is giving you and they shall judge the people fairly, righteously. Do not pervert justice or show partiality. Okay, we've seen all that. You know, this is just drumming it in. But here comes another way that could happen. Do not accept a bribe. For a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and twists the words of the innocent. Follow justice and justice alone so that you may live and possess the land the Lord your God is giving you. So another way uh, justice could be twisted, perverted, and you could show partiality is because of a bribe. And this this is where blindness could be a bad thing You see, a a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise. It means they don't look clearly at the truth of the matter. It twists what they see. Now, of course, um, bribes could be explicit and obvious, backhanders and so on. You know, I I trust we know that's bad. I'd hate to think that would actually happen in church life. But bribes presumably could be implicit and subtle. You're in someone's favor. You know they'll support you in the future. Maybe they'll mention giving to the church. Don't let such things blind you. Follow justice and justice alone. And I've said this reflects God, justice in God, justice in his people. Let's just see that explicitly. Uh, We're told of God earlier in Deuteronomy. The Lord your God is the God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality and accepts no bribes. He defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow and loves the foreigner residing among you, giving giving them food and clothing. This is why you act justly. God does it. God doesn't ever show partiality. He defends right causes. You're to defend right causes. Last one. Do not deprive the foreigner or the fatherless, the orphan, of justice or take the cloak of the widow as a pledge. Okay, so don't deprive them of justice. We've seen that. This time what I want to show you is the reason. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and the Lord your God redeemed you from there. That is why I command you to do this. As slaves, they were treated unjustly. They were the oppressed. They were the vulnerable They were exploited and God had compassion on them and rescued them. Now they are to treat those in their community who are vulnerable the same way. Our care of the most vulnerable and seeing that they get justice says something about how well we understand God's grace to us. There is a quick overview of some of the Old Testament laws on justice. Uh, Let's do what we did yesterday. If you are here, uh, have some moment for reflection. Discuss with your neighbor just what what strikes you from those laws. What hits you? What do you think is important, significant? And I'd like you to feed that in on the app. And any questions that you'd like to ask uh, from any of that, feed those in on the app. So discuss with your neighbor. Get typing on the app and then we'll get Phil up and he'll feed back some of, our, some of your comments to everybody. Go for it. Okay, folks, let's draw back together. Thank you very much for your... 
uh, conversations. I hope that's been helpful amongst you. <clears throat> and then sending some of those in. And Phil is going to um, uh, either report back on your comments, although I'm t he's told me it's mainly questions. And I, I'm, I'm t t let me just tell you what we're going to do. Having done this, we're going to have a look back, look through a bit, bit more Old Testament, then some New Testament, and then we're going to reflect again. And so we'll have, try and have more time for Q and A there, and that might be where we're landing a bit more in church life. So this is more, this is a staging post, but we'll do some questions. We'll see how far we get. Phil. So, so what I'm going to do today is I'm not going to delete any to clear the cache. So I'll leave them all in the approved, and you can see what people are asking. You can upvote them if it's a question that you particularly. Um, want uh, asking, and we can do the most popular ones. So in terms of comments, um, uh, our culture picks sides before it knows what actually happened. We mustn't show that partiality in any direction. Very good. Um, what strikes me is that God is, oh, hang on, that's disappeared. Um, it strikes us how contemporary the implications are. Yeah. Uh, what strikes me is that God is asking us to remember our times of suffering, times when we suffered injustice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, what else have we got here? Um, struck by the command not to follow the crowd and the implication that the crowd can pervert justice, perhaps even when it sounds like they are advocating justice. Yeah, that's very contemporary, isn't it? In terms of a, a very loud voice of a large crowd. And, that, and they could be right. We're not, we're not to dismiss them, but we're not to follow the majority necessarily to make, our, make, make right judgments. Mm. Uh, we have a brackets, not very memorable, close brackets, phrase in church life. We want the weakest voice to be able to speak out against the most powerful person if they experience injustice. Yeah. And it's based on all this. That's, that's very good. Well done for you and your church in embodying that. Um, translating into the new government where we have heart-driven spirituality instead of legislated, generosity is a driving principle behind this. Yeah. Um, struck that some groups are more likely to be disadvantaged and need protecting. Yes, yes. Um, striking that all these issues were present among God's people and need addressing. Um, God is a realist. He knows, what the human heart is, he knows that the human heart is prone to injustice. His laws help protect us from sin and folly. He also knows our pressure points, bribery, fear, and partiality helps warn us about them through his laws. Isn't that well done? Well, isn't that great? God, God's a realist. He knows how we'll be affected. Mm. He knows we'll follow, want, want to go with the majority. He knows we'll be afraid of people in making, he knows we might be tempted by a bribe of whatever sort. And so he specifically goes, watch out for. Mm. Mm. Uh, great point. Do you need some questions? Questions, right? go for some questions. So I'll do the ones that have got the most votes. Um, so these are ones that other people would want to ask, I guess. Um, how do we connect legal justice with church justice? For example, a church member has broken the law and is sent to prison. Uh, should there be further church discipline in view when they return to the fellowship? Hmm, very good question. I guess it's just important to point out that in, in, in looking at the Old Testament laws, um, they were both the kind of the, what I might call the, the kind of community of God's people amongst themselves, and they were like a, a state embodying the justice of the state. They, they were both together. So Israel had the power to inflict, you know, like legal penalties, like the death penalty. That's not our situation. Um, when the Apostle Paul comes across you know, the situation in Corinth and someone committing sexual immorality, well, that, you know, if he's committing adultery or something, that would, that would have been death. And he doesn't say you should kill him. He says you should put him out of the church. Um, and respects, we've commented on this last night, Romans 13, he respects the state as the agent of God's justice in bearing the sword. So, that's just, that's the framing. So, uh, very good question. Of course, first of all, we should say, we should make use of the state. I know it wasn't asked, but some churches have tried to basically you know, investigate and, and, and decide things all within themselves and not bring in a legal authority when it really should be brought in. No. We respect the authorities. They might not all get it right. They, should, they will then bring whatever penalty, say in this case prison, might be appropriate. The church then has to both respect that has happened and decide what it would do amongst itself. 
It may be that there is a place for church discipline, depending on what's happened. Just to point out, church discipline, um, I, I would argue, is what you do when somebody is unrepentant, not just when they've been grossly sinful. So the person might go to prison, but be utterly repentant and ashamed over it and go to prison saying, I deserve this and come back to the church and say, I am so sorry. There's no need to discipline that person. Discipline is warning someone that they're not bowing to Jesus as Lord. It's not saying you've been very naughty. That's, it's, you know, and, some, and some churches struggle. They, it's like, that's so bad, we ought to do something. No, we believe the gospel. We do something when that person isn't responding to the gospel. Thanks, Graham. Very helpful. Um, this is a good question. Uh, why privilege the word justice in relation to how Christians should relate to the world? I find it hard to see this language of justice and injustice in the Old Testament transferring post the cross into the church's mission in the new. Okay, why privilege the word? Um, well, I'm, we're partly looking at the word justice because that's the theme of the conference. Um, um, uh, that question, though, is asking about justice in the world. Yes. That's tomorrow. <laughs> okay? No, but seriously, what, what we're doing, because I'm only in stages, justice in God. Now we think about justice in his people. Justice in the, do we have a responsibility for justice in the world to work for it in some way? We'll think about that. That's much more debated. I take it we all believe in justice in God. Yes? Yes. I take it from this, and we'll see some New Testament stuff in a minute, we could believe that that should have implications for how we live as his people and exercise justice in our own judgments in the church. Yes? We may disagree on what it looks like in the world. We'll come to that tomorrow. Thank you. Um, how do we hold together the commands not to show partiality and favoritism to all people, and yet are called to do good, especially to those who belong to the family of believers? Yes. So that's Galatians 6. Yep. Um, do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers or the household of faith, depending on the translation. Um, what that verse is recognizing is there's this stance of doing good to people, but there's a kind of proximity and relational obligation to those in the family of faith. It's a bit like your own nuclear family. You know, you should be kind to everybody. You should be particularly kind to your own children because you're responsible for them and they're closer to you. So that's what that verse is saying. Um, does that mean there's a kind of right form of favoritism? In, in a sense, yes, in that we look after our own people. Um, but that's not the sort of favoritism and partiality the, these commands are talking about. That's where we're making some kind of judgment about a right or a wrong, and I could, f I could show a preference for somebody just because they are closer to me. Suppose they are somebody at the heart of the church, but actually that favoritism is mean I'm, I am perverting justice. That's, that's bad favoritism. That's not just you're close to me so I care for you. That's you're close to me so I'm going to overlook the fact you're the one in the wrong. That's what he's against. Thank you. Um, this is a great question. Are we poor on justice in the church because we don't preach Old Testament law enough? And how might we go about doing this, I like this bit, in a manageable way? In a manageable way. <laughs> Oh, what an interesting question. Um, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. Um, I, mean, I found it really interesting looking at these laws, and there are loads more than these. I mean, I had to, I had to pare this down. You know, even last week, I was going, oh, no, I'd better cut that one out and that one out because there are too many. Um, so, you know, you could easily do a topical sermon on this. That would be a good thing to do. But you could do a topical sermon on lots of aspects of Old Testament laws. I, I guess I just encourage you that that principle of the Old Testament law shapes God's life, the life of God's people together, and so gives us examples of how they're to love each other. I think that's a principle that we need to grasp. And when Paul says things like Romans 13, whatever commandments there are, they're enfolded in the command to love, or Galatians 5 has, has, you know, for fulfilling the law to love. We'll see it again in James 2 in a minute about fulfilling the royal law of love. The, and so we talk about the church as a community of love and everyone would say amen. 
to recognize there's a kind of a shape and a robustness to that that the law helps us with. Maybe in preaching New Testament passages, you come across those. Give some examples from, old, from, from, the, old, from the Old Testament of what, of what love might look like in practice. You know, you find your neighbor's donkey wandering in the street. What are you supposed to do? What are you supposed to do, do you know? Take it back to them. You don't just go, well, they let them wander off, idiot. That's not very loving. No, you take it. Now, okay, we don't tend to find you. So what do I do if I find someone's phone on a seat at the conference? I don't just walk away. I go, well, I better go and take that to it. Yeah. And I, I guess we kind of know that sort of thing, but it just makes it very concrete. So um, I think, unless there's one really important one, we better move on. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, I'll great. Them. I'll keep them in. Keep them. We can come back to some. We'll see how we go. Let's continue and um, look at some bit more material. So just to think about the wider Old Testament, I just thought just, give, just to give a little bit of a survey, um, there are some examples in Old Testament history of this. I'll just point out a couple. One Samuel 8, for example. Samuel's sons are notorious examples of those who pervert justice, twist justice, and exactly what we've been talking about. They take bribes. God then specifically brings his judgment on them. A positive example, Solomon. Solomon asks for wisdom to discern what is right. That's the usual translation. It is literally what is just. He wants to be able to judge justly. 1 Kings 7, he builds a hall of judgment or a hall of justice. 1 Kings 10, the queen of Sheba comes and she, you know, it's like the high point of the Old Testament, isn't it? The queen of Sheba comes. It's like the nation's coming and seeing the kingdom in its glory. And she praises God as she sees Solomon execute justice and righteousness. And you know, she sees lots of other things, but a key part of what she says is so brilliant about living in Israel at that time is that it's marked by a wise and a right and a just judgment. How brilliant it would be, how blessed it would be to live under this king, she says. There's just a little snippet of what God was looking for. Then in the prophets, we see a couple of things. We, we, you know, we see a call to live out these laws of justice. You know, the prophets often look back to the law. I presume you know that. They often, what, they, what they tell people to do is usually just re repetition of law or they condemn them for not fulfilling law. And so we saw this in Isaiah 1 last night. Learn to do right. Seek justice. What will that look like? Defend the oppressed, take up the cause of the fatherless, please the case of the widow. As we said last night, injustice is not only sins of commission where you do something wrong, there's a kind of a legal infringement, there's also a sin of omission where defense isn't given or a case isn't pleaded when it should have been. And the prophets are full of accusations against injustice. We saw some of those last night. Let's move on to the New Testament. Uh, just briefly, a couple of verses which I think we'll, you'll, you'll know, but I think having covered some of the Old Testament law, when you read them, they have a different sort of resonance or a deeper resonance. So, James 1. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. It's like the cause of the fatherless and pleading the case of the widow. Uh, similarly, the Apostle Paul says in uh, Galatians about talking with the other apostles, all they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor. Again, it, it resonates with that Old Testament emphasis. Our churches should have an appropriate care for those who are poor, for those who are more vulnerable. 
Uh, The other theme that resonates hugely is that of favoritism. So, uh, this is um, James 1. We'll just go through it in a few verses. It begins, My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. And you probably know this passage involves a rich person being treated differently. A rich person comes in and they're shown a good seat and so on. A poor person comes in in rags and they're told they can sit in the corner, etc. Now, I take it just, I mean, it's just worth pausing. And, th- you know, you read that and you, I don't know, you kind of think, what were they thinking? You know, that's awful. Presumably, they didn't think that at the time. Presumably, for whatever reason, in their culture and their background and their thinking, that was okay. They weren't doing it going, we're acting terribly here. And so the, the question we have to come to in a minute is, in what ways might we show favoritism and just not get it? Because I don't think they got it. James says you mustn't show favoritism. And he goes on to say, um, if you do that, have you not discriminated and become judges with evil thoughts? You've shown, a, you've shown, you've shown wrong discrimination. You've treated that person differently to that person. And you've passed judgment, but it's like an evil judgment or a twisted judgment. And then he goes on to say, you've dishonored the poor. You've not shown right regard for that more vulnerable person. But then he sums up at the end of the passage If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. Takes us back to where we started. The law gives examples of love. The law can be summed up in this royal law to love your neighbor. But if you show favoritism, You're breaking the law. Favoritism and discrimination is unloving. Uh, Last example uh, in Acts 6. It doesn't mention the word injustice, but I think that's what's happening. Uh, The number of disciples was increasing and the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. Um, Hellenistic Jews are those with a Greek background and probably Greek speaking, Hebraic, Jewish, probably, probably speaking Hebrew and so on. And for whatever reason, and we don't know why, we don't know if it was a, you know, a management, an organizational issue. We don't know if it was a kind of Racist issue. Are the our, our, our widows are more important than their widows? They're like the foreigners. They're like the newcomers. We don't know if it was a unconscious bias issue. There's something going on, but they just don't quite see it. But there's the inappropriate overlooking of a vulnerable group. Who, who might that be in our churches today? Um, let me um, sum up and then we're going to reflect again uh, together. What are some of the key issues we've seen? Well, first of all, to look positively, we want right judgment and action in our church life. I mean, church life, you know, a lot of things in church life involve, you know, our our teaching and our preaching and our discipleship and our evangelism and our prayer and so on. But as you live life together, you make multiple, multiple decisions. I've been in pastor ministry for over 25 years. I can't remember the, you know, the number of things you end up deciding from, from in a sense, quite trivial things. You know, what are you going to do about the, you know, the serving of the coffee on a Sunday to really significant 
things, there's a dispute between people, they've fallen out and you have to make some kind of intervention. Multiple, multiple decisions and in all of them, we want right judgments and action, fair judgments, judgments in accordance with God's righteousness, not affected by any of those other issues that we've been mentioning. Uh, Secondly, we want care of the vulnerable. We've seen that along the way. The poor, the widow, the foreigner, those who could have less social capital, less voice in the life of the church. Who are they? If I don't even recognize who they are, I probably will overlook them without realizing. And then how might I mitigate against that in some way? We don't we don't overbalance, remember, it's not, you know, God's against favoritism in either direction, but I've got to be alert. Then there is the dangers of favoritism. Where might we show that? Who might we show it to? The people we like, the people we get on with better, the people who are more influential, the people who we feel are supportive of us? Where might we discriminate against people? Uh, Maybe consciously, maybe without realizing. And within that, there's the potential for being influenced. The pressure of popular opinion the temptation and pressure of the subtle bribe or threat. Yeah, and you've probably heard these sorts of stories, but I, I, I know of churches where you know, there's been some decision about it's a building project, it's a new staff post, it's a church plant or whatever it is, and somebody says, you better not, or you'd better, and my giving is on the line for it. I mean, I, 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 I can't believe it in a sense that someone would actually say that, but I know that has happened. But as we said earlier, it could be much more subtle than that. And God knows us well enough to know he needs to warn us. So, there's my attempt at some key issues we need to be aware of for justice in the church. Um, With your neighbor, one question, what areas of application can you see in your church? Uh, Have a chat with your neighbor again. Please feed in some examples uh, using the app. Please also ask some questions and we can come back to some of the questions we didn't get to earlier. So a few minutes chatting with your neighbor uh, and then we'll call back together and we'll have some time for discussion. Go for it. Okay, let's draw back together. And um, Phil tells me lots of stuff's been uh, coming in. So, Phil, some, some comments, some areas of application, and um, some questions. Let's go for it. Uh, okay, so, um, let's see. Yeah, a comment here. Some church members withhold their service in ministry if they don't like decisions made. And in this way, they can be bribing essentially yeah that's i think that's the i mean it's a kind of if you won't play it my way i'm taking my toys and (laughs) going home um and you know got to continue to love those people and care for those people but not let that kind of implicit threat or action shape how you how how you make your decisions that is that is a form of bribery or threat um, we want to be equipping saints for works of service. Perhaps that can wrongly lead us to overlook those who we feel have less to give. Yeah, thank you. That's huge, isn't it? And look, there are going to be all sorts of wisdom judgments here. Who you invest time in, who you maybe give training to, and so on. I don't, I don't think it's wrong that you say, oh, you know, I, I, I met with someone one-to-one, probably gave him more time than I might have given many other people in the life of the church. Um, but because he had particular potential, he's actually taken over from me as pastor. <laughs> yeah, well, wonderful. But that should never be to the neglect of others. 
So it's not, it's not that everyone gets allotted a certain hour, you know, <laughs> hourly rate of the pastor. There are real wisdom decisions to make, but no one should be neglected. And I shouldn't say, I think, as a pastor, I, I only see people like this, and so on. Um, are our church cultures so busy that we rush making judgments and taking actions, or do we therefore overlook the vulnerable or issues of influence and favoritism? All these things need time and prayerful consideration. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes, possibly. It's going to depend on your church. So you, you, you could be too quick. You could not listen well enough. I think that's probably a key issue is not just the time you take, but the time, as in the time you take to think and reflect, the time you take to hear and to hear from different people. But I do know of other churches that probably spend too long circling. You know, you just have to decide some things and get on, you know. Um, so you have to make your own judgment on where your church falls. Um, it's a couple of like questions I want to group, if that's all right. Yeah, that's fine. Um, so here's a comment that will springboard, or a couple of comments that will springboard into a question. Um, international people can be inadvertently excluded from church decisions because their church background has very different structures and ways of doing things. Mm. Um, and then let's link to uh, this one. As a non-British uh, in a white middle-class English church, I love my brothers and sisters. They are loving and caring. We share one Lord Jesus. With 20 different cultures, we face daily the question of fairness and unconscious bias, even in hospitality. And then the question that then followed, which came in earlier, which was really helpful, I think, is um, to what extent might local churches welcome and hospitality be the place of most obvious injustice in the church today in terms of the way we try and connect those kind of different cultures and do intercultural ministry, I guess, is where that's coming from. Mm. There's a lot there, sorry. Yeah, no, no, no. This is a grouping of the questions. Yeah, yeah that, that's great. Hey, look, and well done. You, you, I mean, I think it's I, asking the right question, identifying the potential issue, we're a lot of the way there. I know the solutions aren't easy, and I can't tell you how you should run your church, but we're a lot of the way there. Yes, I do, I mean, you know, our culture is quite sharp on unconscious bias, that the idea that you have a bias towards or against people that you're unaware of, um, that can be overplayed and it can be kind of weaponized. You know, you think things without realizing it, you're awful kind of attitude. And so there, there are ways that is misused, but as an observation on how we function, I think it's undoubtedly true. I have unconscious bias. I mean, we used to just call it blind spots. You know, it's just a, it's a new name and perhaps a more detailed analysis of something which is true of us. And I think we have to be aware of that. So, like I became aware, for example, we were talking, we actually went through as elders, we went through the elder qualifications and we just had to pick one that uh, we wanted to grow in. So it was a sharing exercise amongst the elders. I picked hospitality and the reason I did, the word hospitality, when we say hospitality, um, we, we easily just think, have people over for meals. The word is, in a sense, much more challenging than that. You know, you know, xenophobia is the fear of, or sort of even hatred of strangers, those who are different to you. In Greek, this is the opposite. This is xenophilia, love. It's love of strangers, love of those who are different. So having your friends over for a meal, in a sense, isn't really hospitality. I don't know, it kind of is, that's okay. Don't get too anal about it, you know. But actually, it's welcoming the people who are different to you. Who is, that's, that's real hospitality. And the reason I picked it was, I, there were, we, had a, we had a number of, particularly um, um, East Asians at our church, and I realized that my tendency was to be friendly in going and saying hello, but I found conversation really hard work. I found accent really tricky, and I basically realized I was going to be saying, hello, nice to see you, so glad you're here, and then I'd move on quickly. And I wasn't really welcoming them. And I realized I had that unconscious bias. And so what did hospitality look like for me in that, in terms of really actually trying to have a proper conversation, painful and awkward as I might find it, and so on.
So I think in there, there's lots of potential for those being the groups that we could discriminate against. In another church, it might even be that's the group that gets overly focused on, and maybe it's the elderly white British who are overlooked or something. You have to assess that. Reflect on your church and ask that question. Thanks, Graham. Uh, Linked to that, there's another kind of grouping of questions, which is really about how pastors and pastoral ministers use their time. So there will always be folk in church who are perhaps more needy in particular ways, perhaps who are shouting the loudest um, uh, about sort of care and attention of the, of the pastor. There's a few questions that have come in, in in that vein about how time is used. But it's probably summed up by this one. Um, time with my members seems very unfairly distributed. Is that just realistic? Or do I have to look out for those who don't clamor for my attention? And how do I do that, I guess? Yeah, well, again, well done. Great question. And in asking the question, you're a, you're a long way there. Um, as, I, as I said earlier, I, I don't think it's that we kind of go, I've got this amount of time, I've got this number of members, and they all get an equal allowance. You know, I just don't think that works. Plus, we mustn't be overly pastor-centric in this. I take it we believe, at least, well, I tell you, I believe, first of all, <laughs> Um, I'll include you in this, we believe in plurality in leadership. So it's not just me, if I'm a pastor. And secondly, we believe in the body. So my big question is, are people cared for appropriately, not are they cared for by me? That has to be a key. And, And in one sense, my job is to oversee the life of the church to make sure that is happening. Now, if I then only ever spend time with certain sort of people, that could send its own message. That could be unhelpful. I could avoid certain people. So there could be injustice in that and discrimination in that. But it's not that I have to just share my time up uh, um, um, equally. But within that, I think one one key thing to point out, those, those who don't shout, I think that's a really good question. Um, if, you're, if you're a church leader and if you do this sort of thing, I used to take our, our kind of attenders or a you know, some members book, I'd pray through it. Um, and one thing I'd ask myself is how, how do I think that person's doing? Or as elders, we would do that. And so we're just gradually working through everybody and just kind of going, how are they? What should we pray for them? And so on. And at least we're kind of bringing each person to mind. And that might mean, well, actually, I've got no idea how they're doing. You know, I've, I've made some phone calls just kind of going, I was just, we were just praying for you the other day, and I realized I didn't really know how you're doing. How are you doing? Oh, we're fine. <laughs> but at least they felt like we, we'd noticed and kind of cared, and maybe actually we're not fine. So what, what mechanisms, and unfortunately you probably need, if it's the largest church particularly, you might need some sort of system that helps you think that through as a leadership team, as a staff team, whatever whatever's works for your size and shape of church. Um, what, what might showing favoritism look like in the church to certain people, groups? How might that cash out in day-to-day church life? And then, then the, the question kind of goes a bit broader. We can even do it as organizations. So as FIC, do we give more time to particular ministries, particular churches, particular groups. I think we've got to be honest about that. It happens at local church level. It happens at organizational level. What what can we look out for? Yeah, well, in one sense, that's the question I'm asking you. (laughs) So I was asking you for the examples. I think we've kind of covered that to some extent. It's it's where I, I, I overly focus on a group or preference a group and overlook or discriminate another group. I mean, it could be in all sorts of ways. I mean, preaching. Where do I pitch my preaching? Are there a group in my church who are constantly struggling because I'm too long, too abstract, too intellectual, whatever, for example? And I might just say, well, that's just me and that's just how I communicate or whatever. But if I know that's the case and people are struggling, I've got to think about that. Um, who are the people whose voices we don't hear? And I think we've got to particularly think about this if we're, if we're a complementarian church and we have, uh, um, say, a male eldership. 
how do we rightly hear female voices, not in ultimate oversight and decision making because we think that's done by the elders, but that the elders would be as well informed as they can be and should be to make good decisions. You know, my, my, my wife's sitting down there, it's like if, if we're deciding something, you know, I don't just sit in there and think, what do I think would be good? We talk about stuff so I know what Karis thinks about things. Well, elders don't just sit and think, what do we think would be good for the church? We talk to the church and we hear. How does that happen? Are there some voices we hear and some voices we never hear? Because we never solicit that. That would be just a few examples. As a follow-up to that, it's, a, I guess, a more personal question, but have you ever looked back and realised you were unhelpfully influenced in making decisions in church life? <sighs> Uh, yes, and I think probably f there are probably far more than I'd realise. And it's probably it's probably a combination of things. I think of one example. It's not wasn't just as simple as um, being influenced by somebody. An, an awkward pastoral situation where I look back and I realise I should have. You know, I, sp I spoke to the person concerned. I said a few things. I didn't say anything wrong. I think I made a wrong judgment, but I didn't say, I think probably explore as much as I should have done. And there were knock on, it was, it was somebody whose parents were in the church. I should have gone and spoken to the parents. And it wasn't like I was influenced in a kind of popular opinion swaying me or something. It was more I was worried about them and I was worried about what they'd think and say and what knock on effects there might be. And it just felt like, do as little as possible because I'm worried about the waves that might be created. So it was that kind of fear, quite low level, but it definitely influenced things. And it meant, if I look back now, I think I, would, I should have done that differently. And how do we avoid judging the sinful behavior of some, particularly poorer folk, which is quite obvious, whilst ignoring the sins of the middle class folk, which are often more concealed? Oh, very good. Very good. I think having, having the classification in our heads of sins of commission and omission. So there might be the over expenditure, for example, of some people who have got themselves into debt or something like that, say, and let's not, in front of the stereotype, but let's say that, you know, more working class or something, just say that was the case. And we think, oh, terrible, you know, self-control and da da da. And I don't see the the lack of generosity of those who could afford to give much more. Um, sins of commission are more obvious. You overstep a line. You could basically live quite a respectable, kind of upstanding kind of church life life, but be committing quite a lot of sins of omission. I think, I think that, that's a really helpful thing to, to, to bear in mind. But, but to know, the, the problem is they're more hidden. They're just more hidden. Um, I think we have to bring culture into it to a certain extent. You know, I hope we, we, we know this. Someone comes from a certain background, a certain lifestyle and so on. I mean, you know, we don't expect the middle class or the, the upper middle class or the whatever person to kind of like cast off all of their kind of values and aspirations and whatever. And we don't expect that of the working class person or the person from an abusive background or the person for whom swearing was normal. You, you don't expect people to just transform and yet some people might stand out in church life more than others because of those factors. And we just have to, we have to name that. And this is, this is probably more then about setting a certain culture and tone in the church where we are generous to each other and appreciative of people's backgrounds. Time for one more? Uh, one more, then we'll stop. Okay. Um, those suffering from me mental illness are disadvantaged and may not be taken seriously. How can we protect them and their opinions without the church being damaged? <sighs> Just a quick one to finish. Just a quick one to finish. Well, again, well done for spotting the group, spotting the issue. We're a lot of the way there. 
it's going to vary hugely on on the on, on the person and the issue in question. Because if we're talking about the person who's overly anxious, and that, so that, that's their mental health problem, as it were, really anxious about things, and so, I don't know, um, uh, you're planning some new ministry, you're planning a church plant, so they're particularly anxious about the impact or something, and you, well, you want to care for them well in that, you want to spend, you probably spend more time with them, hearing their concerns and trying to address them, because you know they're vulnerable and sensitive on that area. Um, but you're not going to let them dictate. But, but we've, we've had situations in church life where someone's mental health basically means what they're saying is, is it's just kind of rubbish. I mean, it's just madness. You know, as you, so you, you spend time with them and you listen to them and you say, I've heard you, but I don't want to reassure you about that in a sense. It's just you're, you know, you can't do that. You can't do that. I just have to care for you where you are. So it's going to depend hugely on what sort of issue we're talking about. Thank you. Great. So many good questions. Sorry I didn't get to them all, um, but yeah, they, they've all been read and saved. Thank Brilliant. Thank you very much, Phil, for leading us uh, through that.